Welcome to UCLA. I'm Elizabeth Lester. I'm the executive director of the Asia Pacific Center, and we are thrilled to be joining forces with China Week LA for the first time this year. Uh, and we're so glad uh, to see so many of you uh, attending today. It's going to be a really wonderful event. Um, so we will start off with some preliminary remarks by some of our distinguished uh, executives and uh, faculty here. Um, so I would first like to uh, introduce and welcome Dr. Cindy Fan, who is UCLA's Vice Provost for International Studies and Global Engagement. And she is the first woman and the first Asian to hold that position. She is also a professor here in our geography department and has previously served as chair of the Asian American Studies Department and associate dean of social sciences at UCLA. Uh, as UCLA's senior international officer, Dr. Fan provides strategic leadership for the university's international partnerships in education, as well as global engagement. She also oversees the International Institute and its 30 interdisciplinary research centers and degree programs, of which the Asia Pacific Center is one. Professor Fan is internationally known for her research on migration, regional development, and gender in China. And her book, China on the Move, Migration, the State, and the Household, is a pioneering study of rural urban migration and split households in China. Vice Provost Fan. I should confess that I usually do not wear red <laughs> because blue is actually UCLA's color. But since today's topic is China, I feel that I, I, I searched and searched this morning and found something red to, to wear. Um, so as Elizabeth uh, mentioned, my name is Cindy Fan. I'm the Vice Provost for International Studies and Global Engagement uh, at UCLA. And part of my portfolio is the International Institute that has more than 30 different research centers and degree programs. And I must say that the Asia Pacific Center is one of the most successful centers within the International Institute, and also my favorite, so. <laughs> and I wanna thank director of the center, uh, Professor Minzo, and executive director, Elizabeth Lester, and assistant director, Erin Miller, for excellent job that they have done. And I also wanted to thank Peter, Peter and Catherine Xiao for their leadership in China Week LA and uh, the mission of which is to highlight China's importance uh, in Los Angeles and California. And the theme of this afternoon's public forum is how Chinese immigration and US-China relations impact Chinese America. I cannot think of another topic more timely than this one. Um, well, you may know that May is actually Asian American Heritage Month, so that's one of the reasons why this topic is timely. And the second reason is, I think, to say that U.S.-China relations is challenging is really an understatement. <laughs> um, however, since there was this thing that we call U.S.-China relations, it's always been challenging. Um, and I think the two nations have always been able to find a way um, to, to resolve their differences, to resolve their disagreements. So I remain optimistic. Um, and, and this topic today not only uh, highlights uh, and signifies the Asia Pacific Center's commitment to community engagement and to trans-Pacific issues. It also exemplifies UCLA's commitment to diversity and global engagement. And I want to share some thoughts and some experiences from two points of view, from an institutional educational point of view and also from a personal point of view. Um, as an educator, one of my goals is to enable all UCLA students and for that matter all American students to aspire to become global citizens. And what do I mean by being global citizens? And if I'm allowed to cite um, somebody's work, and her name is Sheila Biddle, she defines global citizenship uh, through the following four things. Okay. The first is to have the knowledge about the world. 
And second is to have global proficiency, such as languages, such as intercultural skills. And third is to recognize one's role in the world and one, one's responsibility to shape it and to improve it. So that's action. And the fourth is an attitude, and that is be humble, to have a sense of humility, and to be aware and to realize one's biases. And I think UCLA is really committed to having our students acquire those those skills and to become global citizen. Um, UCLA has had courses on China since 90, 1930. 1930. That's probably before most of us were born, I think, or all of us were born. <laughs> and, and UCLA was among the first US universities to establish relations with China since it opened its doors in the late 1970s. And today, UCLA has more than 3,000 students from China. Uh, we have numerous partnerships with Chinese institutions, and we have numerous programs and projects on and about China on campus. And from a personal perspective, 30 years ago, um, I became an assistant professor at UCLA, having completed a, uh, my PhD at o Ohio State University as an international <coughs> student. And since that time, I've been on this journey to discover Asian America and Chinese America. And my identities have expanded, and I find myself straddling different worlds, multiple worlds. And this is a, both a fun and sobering experience. Um, and I'm very proud and humbled to be the first woman, first Asian, and first Chinese American to be the chief international officer at UCLA, and in this role, I'm keenly aware of the many challenges I face, but also at the same time, my privileged role to, to be able to encourage and perhaps inspire other women and other minorities to step up to the plate and to be in charge. Um, and as a, as a scholar and researcher who does work uh, on migration in China, I experienced China um, firsthand, and that allows me then to tell stories about China that are not linear, that are multidimensional and that are complicated. Um, and I also enjoy people watching in China. Now, uh, I find myself, when I'm in a supermarket in China, I find myself often being the only one who uses cash. <laughs> feel like a dinosaur, you know? Because nobody else does that. Everybody uses their phone. They don't even carry wallets with them. So I think there's a lot to observe and learn and, 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 be, and, 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 and be surprised in China. And for five years, I taught a uh, UCLA travel study program in China, in Beijing. And, my, and I, I so enjoyed seeing my students uh, being transformed by their experience. And the, and the last experience I wanted to share is that last Saturday, I was in a um, local Chinese school, Saturday Chinese school, and I saw an African-American man, after dropping off his child, practice writing Chinese on a piece of paper. And his handwriting is better than mine. <laughs> so all of that is to really um, tell me that that uh, th the reason why I strongly believe that in order to solve today's world's uh, problems, one really has to work together, one has to work together, and has to have an open mind, and also has to learn. And I think China Week LA provides a lot of that, with foods, with films, with fashion, with hip hop, with expert panels. So congratulations. Um, all of you, and especially China Week and also Asia Pacific Center for doing such a good job, and I look forward to our partnerships for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And I would next like to introduce Mr. Peter Xiao, who is chairman of China Week, as well as its affiliated California-China Business Summit. Peter is a seasoned platform builder at the forefront of cross-border ventures, 
investments, and social enterprises between the U.S. and China. He was founder of the U.S.-China Film Summit and currently serves as the founder and CEO of Immortal Studios, an entertainment studio domiciled in Los Angeles, Hong Kong, and Beijing that encompasses film, television, game, and digital technologies. He is also the founder and CEO of Iron Pond Venture, which is a cross-border investment firm specializing in mature California-China technology-driven enterprises and California infrastructure finance. Prior to his entrepreneurial pursuits, Peter served as chief consultant of the California State Senate Select Committee on the Pacific Rim and was a California State Senate Fellow. Peter is a graduate of UCLA with a degree in political science. It has been a pleasure working with you and with Catherine on China Week this year, and we're delighted to welcome you back to UCLA. This topic is very personal for me because I'm an immigrant. I'm a Chinese-American immigrant. I came to this country as a 10-year-old boy, um, so I had an experience of being Chinese before having an experience of being an American, and it took me quite a long time to figure it all out. To, to balance it together. So this is, and also as a graduate of UCLA, coming here is just so important on so many different levels. Um, I'm a co-founder of an organization called China Week that some of you heard about. Um, several years ago, my wife and I were deciding we're either gonna have another, a human baby or we were going to do something else. <laughs> so this is that something else. And it, and it began with a very, very simple proposition it was a realization that those of us who are in California, and more specifically Southern California, we are actually in the, this is, this is the zero, this is where the rubber meets the road in US-China relations. Um, and having been a, a political person in, my, in a former life, uh, I realized, you know, on a, on a recent visit, on a visit that I had to Washington DC about five or six years ago, I had a chance to talk to various senior elected officials, whether it was our senator, Dianne Feinstein, or getting a White House briefing, I realized that I walked away from those briefings thinking, wow, they're doing a lot of heavy lifting on really, really important critical matters that, took, that may take an entire lifetime to resolve. You know, you have a 20-person team just trying to figure out what to do about Tibet and not have any kind of movement about the trade war issues. But meanwhile, those of us who live in California, engaging with China and figuring out what it means on a day-to-day -day basis is part of what makes us special. And it's what's happening every day, whether it's in schools, in businesses, in cultural life, in a part of my industry in Hollywood, we're changing images. And, and so all of these things are happening here in our backyard. And the vision behind China Week is that we want it to be a media and a brand platform that would bring everybody together. Um, because one of the problems we're very, very aware of is that in, in a very vibrant Chinese, US-China relations is really built upon public awareness and engagement. And I think there's so much work to be done to engage the average American in understanding and up, upping their curiosity. So we wanted to build this kind of platform and the thesis was that we would be able to engage institutions like UCLA um, to give us extraordinary content. So again, thank you for coming through with that part of it. Um, it's also, this is our fourth year, very pleased that our initial thesis that we would be able to bring in all the major institutions. So now as uh, we're going into our fifth year of partnership with the LA Times, a new partnership with, uh, with UCLA, the Milken Institute, the, um, the various museums, we've now created this platform and we are looking to scale it in with your participation in the years to come to make it really, really special. Um, one, of my, um, one of our programs this year, just this past weekend, was a walk through Old Chinatown. So for um, close to three hours this Saturday, uh, my whole family with many, many others who came was part of this walking tour, China Week walking tour, we walked through LA LA's Chinatown and got a history. It's about a hundred year history of what happened. The forefathers who came before us to build this institution now, you know, and seeing now the immigration pattern taking the Chinese experience out to the Silicon, to, to San Gabriel Valley, to other places. So I'm just remembering that 
This is also a time where we're thinking about the transcontinental railroad. Uh, this was a, was a deep moment of reflection of the, the shoulders we're standing on, those voiceless, faceless Californians who made, of Chinese descent who made a huge contribution to this country. Um, and it's very apropos that against new tensions and economic tensions between America and China right now that I believe um, Chinese Americans have a unique opportunity to lead, to navigate, and to, to create a middle ground because I firmly believe that this is, uh, this is not a zero-sum game that either side can afford to lose. Or, so it's really about creating a new possibility and I'm very, very hopeful that Chinese Americans who understand both perspectives, hopefully, can play an important role in navigating this new opportunity for um, a partnership that we probably haven't seen. Uh, so I look forward to the panelists. I look forward to hearing from you, Min, in particular. And thank I want to thank uh, our partner, LA Times, for really giving us such amazing resources to do the things that we do, and all of our team and our staff members at China Week. So thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. And now I would like to welcome uh, my director, uh, Dr. Min Zhou, who is director of the Asia Pacific Center, as well as professor of sociology and Asian American studies, and the Walter and Shirley Wong Endowed Chair in US-China Relations and Communications at UCLA. Uh, and also, from 2013 to 2016, she was a chair professor head of the sociology division and director of the Chinese Heritage Center at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Professor Zhou's main research areas are in migration and development, Chinese diaspora education and the new second generation, and the sociology of Asia and Asian America. She has published widely in these areas, including 17 books and 200 journal articles and book chapters. Her 2015 book, The Asian American Achievement Paradox, which was co-authored with Jennifer Lee, received five major academic awards. Other recent publications include The Rise of the New Second Generation, co-authored with Carl Bankston, and Contemporary Chinese Diasporas. In 2017, she received the Distinguished Career Award of the American Sociological Association's Section on International Migration. And thank you all for coming. Good afternoon and welcome. I thank you very much for making the effort to come to UCLA for this event. And your participation is a great support for us. This afternoon's event is part of the 2019 China Week LA activities. I first thank Peter and Catherine chairman and CEO of China Week LA for partnering with us to co-organize this wonderful public forum. I also thank Vice Provost Professor Cindy Fan for her support. The event is co-sponsored by UCLA International Institute, Asian American Studies Center, Walter and Shelley Wang Endowed Chair in US-China Relations and Communications, Richard C. Rudolph East Asian Library, and Southern California Foundation for the Preservation of Chinese Literature and History. I'm so grateful for the support. In welcoming you to UCLA as usual, I want to do some promotion of our center. I would like to use this opportunity to say just a few words about our center. The UCLA Asia Pacific Center is one of the 25 research centers under the International Institute under the leadership of Vice Provost Professor Cindy Fan and Director uh, Professor er uh, Chris Erickson. Our center strives to promote greater knowledge and understanding of Asia and the Asia Pacific region on campus and in the community through innovative research, teaching, public programs like this one, and international collaboration. 
We are a campus-wide unit focusing on inter-Asian and trans-Pacific cultural and social economic connections and research from historical, contemporary, and comparative perspectives. We encourage interdisciplinary work on cross-border and supranational issues such as language and culture, politics, technology, economy, social economic development, and sustainability in the ongoing processes of globalization. Currently, our center is home to a thriving Taiwan Studies program and a program on Central Asia. The Taiwan Studies program is a very successful program with the generous support from the university and also from the local Taiwanese American community. Particularly mentioned is Mr. Jackson Yang, a Taiwanese American businessman who recently gave us $2 million donation. And with this um, donation, we kind of stabilized the Taiwan Studies program and, uh, and, and took it from a new height. And I'm very grateful for Mr. Yang's family support. Um, we are also uh, trying to build on the success of the Taiwan Studies program. And we are currently in the process of raising funds to develop a Hong Kong Studies program and possibly the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Great Bay Area Studies Program. So I'm pleading to all of you for supporting or partnering with us on this effort to develop our programs. In addition, we are also an academic partner of the Global Chinese Philanthropy Initiative, a project to build a global ecosystem to facilitate Chinese philanthropy and also to connect philanthropists and nonprofit professionals around the world, as well as to promote research on global Chinese philanthropy. We cannot do as much without your enthusiastic support. And your participation, again, is a great support to us. Thank you very much. I also thank our center staff. Uh, you met Elizabeth, Elizabeth Leister our executive director, and Aaron Mira, our assistant director of our center. So we only have two, two and a half people, but we are doing a lot of work. And again, also I thank the student volunteers in helping out with us. Now, it's my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker today, Ms. Mei Chen. May received her bachelor's degree in Chinese literature from the Chinese Cultural University in Taiwan. She immigrated to the US in 1977, and shortly afterward, in 1980, she established and ran a Chinese language newspaper called the Southern Chinese Times. The Southern Chinese Times reported local news of Chinese Americans in Southern California. For more than 10 years, this newspaper was a dominant and influential Chinese language newspaper in Southern California. In 1987, she started a Sunshine, the Sunshine Education Center to teach Chinese language and culture to US-born children of immigrant heritage, of Chinese heritage. In 1989, she founded a nonprofit organization called the American East Asian Culture and Education to serve the cultural and educational needs of the Chinese in Southern California. In 2010, May was elected to be the chairman of the Los Angeles Northern American Chinese Writers Association. Shortly after, she started yet another nonprofit organization, the Preservation of Cultural and Historical Materials of Chinese Americans in Southern California and served as its CEO. May has persisted unselfishly and continuously for the past 40 years and uh, to serve the media and education needs of Chinese Americans in Southern California. For that, she was recognized 
by more than 100 certificates of appreciation, including the ones awarded by the highest ranked Chinese American public officials, Congresswoman Judy Chu, California State Treasurer John Chang, California State Assembly Member Ed Cho, and numerous organizations and mayors of cities of California. In 2009, May spearheaded a major history project on the Chinese in Southern California in the past three decades, and served as the editor-in-chief of an enormous reference book entitled A Legacy Magnified, A Generation of Chinese Americans in Southern California, 1918 to 1910. This reference book has more than one million words, involved 400 contributors, the Chinese version was finished in four years. Then she led the editorial team to spend another four years to translate the volume from Chinese into English. I myself had the opportunity to participate in this project and personally witness May's hard work dedication to the project. Today, May will share with us her perspective on the transformation of Chinese America Let's welcome Ms. Mei Chen. Thank you for Professor Zhou. I'm Madam Vice Provost Cindy Fan. I'm greatly honored to be given the opportunity to speak here about the trans contribution of Chinese immigrants to their new homeland. Chinese Americans are the largest Asian origin group in the United States. Our ancestors arrived in this land earlier than most of the earlier immigrants from the Southern and the Eastern Europe. And we have been in the US for more than 170 years. The first significant group of Chinese immigrants came to USA during the global rush in the late 1840s. The earlier Chinese immigrants were many persons from the Sui area, that is South Canton Province, China. They first worked in um, mining industry and then in building the most difficult part of the transcontinental um, railroad waste of Rockies. However, poor economic conditions in the late 1870s and the view of the yellow pale made Chinese immigrants targets of racism and exclusion, lead to the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Consequently, Chinese immigrants built Chinatowns for self-protection and recognition their life in Chinatowns in California and in other urban centers across the country. Even after the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943 and the U.S. and China became allies in World War II, the Chinese Americans contributed and its members were largely excluded from participation and assimilation in American life. Despite years of Chinese exclusion and uh, harsh racial discrimination, however, Chinese Americans persisted and have continued to work hard to make America home. Since the 1970s, we have witnessed the remarkable transformation of Chinese America. Demographically, the number of Chinese Americans has grown, especially increasing from 2,040,000 in 1960 to more than 5 million in 2017, primarily due to the international migration. At the present, the United States is home to the largest contribution of 
people of Chinese descent outside southern East area. What is most striking is that Chinese immigrants are coming from diverse origins, from diverse different places in mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and other parts of the world. They are also diverse in social economic backgrounds, including not only low-skilled rural peasants and urban workers, as well as penniless refugees, but also highly educated professionals and resourceful entrepreneurs and investors. And they are no longer segregated in Chinatowns. Rather, they are spreading all over the country. In the urban centers, suburbs, and even rural area. Now, Chinese Americans have gradually and successfully integrated into mainstream American society and have become highly visible in science, technology, and engineering, medicine, and healthcare, law, business, and education. <coughs> Nationwide, Chinese American as a whole is one of the most educated ethnic minority group. More than 54% of the adult population have received bachelor's degree and the advanced master degree or PhDs. As compared to less than 30% of the total US adult population. In the, low, in the labor market, Nearly half of Chinese Americans hold professional occupations, and their middle household income is 70,000, about the national average of $57,000. Now we have nine Nobel Prize winners, and eight of whom were immigrants. Unlike the old timers who were segregated in ethnic and colorless like Chinese towns, Chinese Americans have now transcended the boundary of Chinatown, settled into middle class suburbs, and transformed these suburban communities. For example, in Los Angeles metropolitan regions, their presence has passed peripherally to the eastward development of more than a dozen cities in the San Gabriel Valley, forming a rural and a unique economic cultural zone referred to as a China Valley. As they are gradually settled down in the, their new homeland, Chinese immigrants and their children are making important contributions to American society. <coughs> These contributions are highlighted in our recently published history book, A Legacy Magnified, A Generation of Chinese American in Southern California. A Legacy Magnified is about the labor struggles, achievements, and the contributions of Chinese American in Southern California during the past three decades. It is a team project, including more than 400 authors and researchers, and using a variety of methodologies, which range from traditional and modern means of recording, oral histories, archival and the secondary data analysis, and media data analysis. I am the chief editor and I would like to use today's opportunity to promote this important book. The main object of this history project is to bridge the gap in our knowledge of contributions of Chinese Americans to American society in the nation's history. The book contains seven chapters with about 1,300 pages covering broad 
topics such as ethnic organization, community development, family, political participation, technology, science, and medicine, education, religion, business, mass media, culture, and art, and sports. Here, I would like to highlight a few examples. One example is Chinese-American advancement in political participation and elections. At the complete of Chinese edition of the book in end of the 2013, there were 36 Chinese Americans in Southern California, elected officials in Congress and city councils. In addition, there were 37 elected school district board members. Congressman Dr. Judy Chu is a prime example. Judy's grandfather was from Guangzhou province. She is a third generation Chinese American born in California. She received his bachelor degree in math with honor from UC Santa Barbara. Her master degree in Asian American studies from UCLA. And PhD from California School of Professional Psychology. In 1985, Judy began her political career as a school trustee in Garvey School District. In 1988, she was elected to the City Council of Monterey Park at the age of 34. In 21st, she won a seat in the California State Senate Assembly. In 26, you run a member for the California Board of Equalization and win. In 2009, you become the first Congresswoman from Southern California in the history of the US Congress. Let me tell another completing story of Chinese American philosophy, the Chinese Indian taking it from society and giving it back to society, resides firmly in the minds of many Chinese Americans. Mr. Min Xiao, an immigrant from China, donated 85 million to USC. Mr. Evans Lam, senior VP of Swiss Bank, and immigrants from Hong Kong, donate $5 million to his alma mater, the University of Rochester, and has donated thousands of dollars to support our history project, and even at the UCLA Asia Pacific Center, include this one. Mr. and Mrs. Walter Wong, whose parents were from Taiwan, donate $2 million to establish endowment chair in the U.S.-China relations and community communications at UCLA and support many other charity projects in California. There are also many charity organizations in the Chinese community in Southern California. The most well-known one is Buddhist Ciji Foundation. Chinese American contribution to the US Army forces is also remarkable. The Chinese enlisted to the US military can be traced back to the period of civil war. There were increasing numbers of Chinese joining the military during War I and World War II. According to the records from the military academy. More than 13,000 Chinese served in the U.S. Army and the Air Force during World War II, even though the ethnic Chinese population in the U.S. in that time was only 78,000. This is 17 percent, which was a much larger percentage than other ethnic groups. 
his stay. They were serving the country even when the country had the laws to excuse them. Many have sacrificed their lives to prove that they are loyal Americans and worthy to respect. Chinese Americans do not simply excel in business, science, and technology, and higher education. They are also wasteful in sports. For example, Michelle Guan, whose parents were immigrants from Hong Kong, is an American figure skater known as a butterfly on the ice. She has received a total of 33 medals, including two Olympic medals and five world championships. She was listed in the U.S. Figure Skater Hall of Fame in 2012. Michael Derby Zhang, born in New Jersey to a Taiwanese immigrant family, is a well-known professional tennis player. He won 34 professional medal tennis first prizes and attended a number two world ranking. At the age of 17, he won the French Open to become the youngest male player even to win a Grand Slam title. <clears throat> There are many, many achievements and contributions. I would like to particularly mention one more, which informed my husband, Dr. Xi Yin Lo. Dr. Lo is a theoretical particle physicist, inventor, professional of physics and Chinese medicine, the maker of double helix water and zinc drink and the founder of uh, Quantum Health Research Center. For more than 30 years, he has done research with top scientists at Caltech and other universities and invent quantum medicine. I believe most of the people want to stay healthy without getting sick or having to take drugs and get surgeries. Dr. Law has succeeded in opening up this opportunity by combining quantum theory with East and West medicine to create quantum medicine. In our book, we record many, many moving stories that illustrate the congressman. Illustrate the, let me see. Sorry. They erase the contribution of Chinese Americans in different areas. No matter what areas Chinese Americans are in, they contribute enormously to make America a better place to live for everyone. I would like to close my by a quote from U.S. Congressman uh, Liu Pingyuan. Mr. Liu is a former city councilman, woman, council member of Torrance. He recalled how his life started from a free market winner to be a political leader. I was born in Tainan, Taiwan, and came to United <coughs> States at the age of three. My parents were immigrants who came to fulfill their American dream. My family eventually owned a total of eight stories. My parents' American dream for prosperity came true. From Harvard University, Stanford University, to Georgetown University, I took the route of higher education with the full support of my parents. I actively participated in politicals because I want everyone in U.S. to have the same excellent education I, I had. In the year of 2002, 
I was elected to the City Council of Torrance. And in 2011, I became a member of the California State Senate. In 2014, I was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Again, my name is Min Zhou. I'm director of the Asia Pacific Center and professor of sociology and Asian American studies, Walter and Shelley Wang, endowed chair in US-China relations and communications. And I, it's my honor to uh, serve as a moderator of this panel. But before that, I would like to have a few words of introductory remarks. The United States concentrates the largest number of new Chinese immigrants, absorbing more than a quarter of the total immigrant from China since 1980. The history of Chinese immigration to the United States dates back to the late 1840s. Early Chinese immigrants were mainly peasants from Siyi area of the Pearl River Delta in South Guangdong Province, China. They first arrived in the U.S. as laborers, working first in mines, in gold mines, but without getting much gold, and then in building the most difficult part of the transcontinental railroad west of the Rockies. There were 23,000 Chinese railroad workers, 85% of the workforce then. They make great contribution to building the American nation. However, poor economic conditions in the late 1870s and the fear of the yellow period made Chinese laborers easy targets of nativism and racism. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act to restrict Chinese immigration and also to restrict the participation of Chinese immigrants already here into American society. The Chinese then were forced into residential segregation and retreat to ethnic enclaves, or Chinatowns, for survival. Even after the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943, and the US and China became allies during World War II, Chinese immigrants and their US-born children were largely excluded from participation and assimilation in American life. That has changed since the 1970s when Congress passed the Hot Seller Act. The new act reformed the US immigration policy, uh, immigration system, and gave priority to family reunification and uh, migration of highly skilled labor. The US immigration policy reform intertwined with the normalization of Sino-US foreign relations in 1979 and also China's open up in the same year um, has led to a continuous and exponential increase of Chinese Im immigra immigration to the US. Over the past 40 years, the U.S. Census show that the number of ethnic Chinese population increased from 240,000 in 1960 to more than 5 million today. So that exponential growth is mainly due to international migration. Chinese Americans, more than two-thirds of them foreign-born, are the largest Asian ethnic group in the U.S are counting for less than 2% of the general U.S. population. Their social economic background are very diverse. Nearly half of the Chinese immigrant population and over half of the general Chinese American population have a college degree, a bachelor's degree or more. And their median household income and also the percent of pro in professional occupation is higher than the general U.S. population. So today, the image of Chinese Americans have changed from the yellow period to the model minority. Our panel discussion will shed light on that change. Uh, so joining me is a group of 
five distinguished panelists. Uh, Professor Jan Lin cannot join us because of some difficult family situation today. So um, uh, um, to my to my right, I'm dyslexia. To my right is Dr. <laughs> is Dr. Um, Yong Chen. Dr. Yong Chen received his PhD degree from Cornell University. He is a professor of history at the University of California, Irvine. His main research areas are on Chinese American history, US ethnic food, and higher education. And he has published widely in these areas, including two important books. Chinese America, Chinese, um, Chinese San Francisco, 1850 to 1943, a trans Pacific community, which is also translated and published in Chinese in China. And another book is Chop Shui USA, The Rise of Chinese Food in America. Professor Chen is also a regular contributor to an editorial column in the World Journal the largest Chinese language newspaper in the US. His recent research on ethnic food has been featured in mainstream presses, such as the Chronicle of Higher Education, US News and World Report, the Los Angeles Times, and the New York Times. He was the co-curator of a museum exhibit on the history of Chinese restaurants in the US in museums of the Chinese in the Americas in New York City and at Walter Kent Museum in, Cap uh, in, Phila in Philadelphia. Uh, next is Dr. Wei Lo. And Dr. Lo received his doctorate in, of education in, edu in leadership and organization behavior and master's degree in educational psychology from the University of Leuven. He is the founder and CEO of Cal Sunshine Education Group a Claremont-based educational organization specializing in English Chinese, English Chinese bilingual school operation in China, international student placement, and short-term exchange programs for American educational institutions and US-China inter-school collaboration building. Prior to his um, career in education, he spent 10 years working as a financial advisor and an executive in the finance industry. He is the former Secretary General, General of the Chinese CEO organization and the past president of Chinese Southwest Federation. Both are Chinese American citizen coalition organizations based in the San Gabriel Valley. Dr. Rowe was born and raised in Beijing, China, and immigrated to the USA in 1991. Um, next is Mr. Eugene Moy um, in the middle. Um, Mr. Moy has been involved in public history and history preservation projects for many years. He has been an active member of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, the Chinese American Museum in LA, the Los Angeles Lodge of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, the Historical Society of Long Beach, the Save Our Chinatown Committee in Riverside, and other organizations. Professionally, Eugene is retired after over 35 years in municipal planning and economic development. Eugene is a native of LA's Chinatown and a graduate of the California State University, Long Beach. Next is Mr. Frank Sean. Frank, Frank is uh, a columnist for the Los Angeles Times, writing about diversity and diasporas in Los Angeles. Frank grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and moved to Los Angeles in 2006 to study economics at UCLA. He joined the LA Times in 2012 and previously reported on the San Gabriel Valley, the Chinese immigration to the Southern land, uh, Southland and the Asian American community. Last but not least is Dr. Xiao Jian Zhao. Um, Professor Zhao received her PhD in history from the University of Berkeley, uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. 
She has been Professor of Asian American Studies at UC Santa Barbara since 1994 and was the former chair of the Department of Asian American Studies. Her research interests are in US history, Asian American history, immigration, family, gender, and law. She has taught courses and um, published in these areas. Her first book, Remaking Chinese America, published by Rutgers University, has received the, book, the Best Book Award from the Association of Asian American Studies. She is also the author of another important book entitled The New Chinese America, Class, Econ Economy, and Social Hierarchy. So first, I would like to um, invite each of the panelists to say a few words about what they are currently doing that has relevance to the issue associated with Chinese America, China, or US-China relations. So shall we start with you? So just say a few words about what you are currently do that has relevance to, to the topic that we are interested in today. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me here. You know, look at this crowd. You know, it, uh, this is amazing. Uh, uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to be here. Um, that's a big question. Um, that's what I do on a daily basis. Uh, that's my life, okay? Um, because everything I, I do, I, I study, I work on has, uh, a very close relation uh, with uh, um, what is going on in the China Pacific uh, American world. Okay, so in terms of research, I um, um, I continue to work on Chinese food in the U.S. A yummy topic, and uh, um, um, and also I'm I'm writing another book about uh, you know um, Chinese students trend. Uh, a study who studied in the U.S. and are now navigating the trans-Pacific space. Okay, and uh, also at the university, uh, um, I'm working with uh, Chinese uh, international students. Many of them are from China. UCRA has uh, Vice Provost uh, Cindy Fang mentioned that UCRA has uh, more than 3,000 students from China. At UC Irvine, we have more than 4,300 students from China. Yeah, so one of the few areas where we uh, are doing better than U UCRA. Um, sorry to say that, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Okay, okay, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Pro uh, Madam Provost, uh, Professor Joe and Lisa. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, event and I'd be honored to share what I and what I see for the Chinese community. Basically, I immigrated to the U.S. in 1991, and currently I'm working for, for the organization called Cal Sunshine Education Center based in Claremont, California. And basically what we do is that we just provide the uh, international education consultation to Chinese schools in China, which want to set up the uh, U.S. Uh, school curriculum and uh, namely AP and IP program, to have the student come to the U.S. persuade their edu higher education. In addition to that, well, I also uh, interested in the topics of comparative education issues, school comparative, and the efficacy of the uh, school factors that uh, uh, in the, throughout the world uh, based upon uh, using the uh, OC OECD's database. And, uh, Basically, I'm married, I have two kids, born and raised up in California, and also I'm very, very happily to report to you that I have a very bloody a connection with sociology, because I was born to a sociology professor in China, and married to a person who is a soci sociology student, and now I have my daughter just graduated from uh, a university of public policy two days ago. Thank you. You too. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I am, as noted by Min, uh, I am a public history advocate. I've been involved in various communities over the years. 
Uh, I am uh, involved because I believe in our Chinese American heritage and our history, not only in LA or California, but worldwide, uh, and also all of the impacts that have been generated through our migration. I myself am an immigrant and a native. I was born in January of 49, one month after my mother got here. So, so I was uh, uh. conceived in China. Anyway, <laughs> but beyond that, uh, I am also a person who grew up during a period of great change in society and have witnessed, been a witness to uh, many destabilizing kinds of, of movements, but also been a witness to many efforts to try and uh, acknowledge and recognize the great diversity in our society. And I, I think uh, one of the motivations uh, beyond just simple education is to really see peace in our world. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Frank Xiong. I'm a columnist with the LA Times. Uh, I guess the last thing I wrote about explicitly the Chinese community was kind of looking at the underground economy of uh, you know, food items in the uh, San Gabriel Valley and how AB 626, this new home cooked food law, uh, is supposed to decriminalize it but didn't end up serving anybody in non-English speaking communities. Uh, but before this I was the, um, uh, and now I basically write about all of the sort of communities of Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I call it diversity and diaspora. Uh, basically, communities of color form basically 73% of Los Angeles now, so it's kind of a wider purview. But before that, I was probably the um, only Metro uh, Daily reporter who covered a Chinese community full time in uh, in 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 the in the city um, in in the country, and uh, wrote about the San Gabriel Valley, and wrote about uh, immigration, and wrote about uh, birth tours and EB five visas, investment, and basically all of the things in which you know knowing about Chinese culture helped you understand the San Gabriel Valley better. Um, and I'm still working on some story ideas from that beat, um, but I, I probably shouldn't talk about them right now. <laughs> Um, thank you, Ming, and uh, thanks, Elizabeth and Professor Fan, uh, for inviting me here. It's a great honor. Um, just in addition to um, what uh, Ming have said, I recently completed a book um, on internal migration, actually, uh, in China, which will be published by Cambridge University uh, Press in August. And uh, currently, I'm also working on another book, uh, which is on Chinese ethnic entrepreneurship. Uh, to most of uh, uh, people, uh, ethnic entrepreneurship involves initiatives by immigrants of modest means, uh, such as restaurants, grocery markets, corner stores, dry cleaners, and the car repair shops, businesses that do not require sophisticated managerial skills and it can be re, uh, can be financed with personal savings and the loans from community credit associations my study approaches ethnic economy in the context of us economy situating ethnic entrepreneurship in the center of american industrial development the study examines the impact of globalization uh, ethnic economy, exploring how Ch Chinese American entrepreneurs have transitioned from localized small business operators to players of global production networks. So it is also a study of globalization, looking at the ways that the national boundaries are compromised, territories are traversed, and the interdependency between nations are created. This panel has a very diverse makeup of um, immigrant heritage. Uh, so I am an immigrant myself, and um, Professor Chen and Professor Zhao are immigrants, and uh, Dr. Lo immigrants, <laughs> and, um, and Frank and Eugene are children of immigrants. So I would like to, and. And we have a generation, 
a, a cohort of different generations too. So I would like to start with Eugene to tell us just one story that you feel most compelling from your own eye, from or your own experience about the transformation of Chinese America. Probably one story. The, you have is, many stories. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's difficult to, to decide what really uh, characterizes the this period of growing up in LA and uh, and, and what my parents would say about that too, uh, because really a, a lot of what we experienced growing up as Chinese Americans was really focused on the the family, either helping with the family business, uh, attending family events, supporting your 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 grandparents. Um, a lot of the reason the reason why. Our, so I'm a native of LA Chinatown. It, it, uh, Chinatowns are this one amazing phenomenon that you can uh, uh, see throughout the world. And so I myself, when I um, take visitors or friends or just walk through Chinatown on a daily basis, you, you feel connected <clears throat> to all of the, the forebears and all of the others who have helped create this amazing place, you know, whether it's from the family associations or the social networks or the temples or the churches. Uh, I, I can't point to any specific uh, 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 aspects of my life, but I know that I enjoy traveling and uh, anywhere, you know, whether it's in Canada or Mexico or uh, other parts of the U.S., and finding our shared, our common heritage. And we find some of the values that we have been, been bred into us, I guess, you know, whether it's Confucianism or Taoism or Buddhism, all of these uh, values, I think, are what bind us all together. I don't know if this is maybe adequate yeah, for now. Thank you. Frank, do you, growing up in Tennessee, do you oh, have yeah. any story <laughs> that's very well, different from LA? Uh, you know, they, there weren't very many Chinese families growing up in Tennessee. I think there was about a thousand in terms of population. We used to drive to Atlanta to, to find Chinese food. Um, and uh, Atlanta has a small Chinatown. That was the first place where I ate uh, dim sum and, and all of that. But what Gene says is really, Eugene says is really true. You know, it's really cool to go around the world. I've been to Calcutta, Chinatown. I've been to Vancouver, Chinatown. You can find different versions of chop suey. And there's this universality that, you know, Chinatowns can connect us to um, by this big history, you know, that I learned by basically interviewing the people on this panel. You know, <laughs> I have to say, uh, when I was Google scholaring, uh, you know, the San Gabriel Valley topics, Minzo's were some of the only articles that appeared back in, you know, 2012. And, and I've, I've definitely called, you know, uh, I've read her book. I have both of your books. I, and, uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I've hit up Eugene so many times to, to, to count. Uh, but in terms of an anecdote that kind of talks about how, you know, Chinese immigration has changed a lot and how it's changed Chinese America. Um, I guess, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, there, there's, there's a lot, I think. And, uh, you know, Chinese immigration when, to the United States, you know, you basically have people coming from very different versions of China. And they're all running into each other in the suburbs of the San Gabriel Valley. You know, so you have, and I don't know, I'm not a scholar, you know, but I do think of it in sort of three chunks, right? You know, which is, you know, pre-1965 and or 1970s and Hart Cellar, which is a lot of Cantonese immigrants. And they came to the U.S. in, in a time of, of great discrimination, right? And that's why Chinatown forms. And then the post-1970s immigration people, they typically came to an environment where suburbanization was occurring. And that, that, that uh, led to the creation of ethnoburbs, you know? And, uh, and then, you know, Min has written plenty about this, I bet. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and now there's, you know, post-2000s migration from, you know, Chinese cities 
uh, and, and elites. And, um, and what you're seeing is, is, is so totally different. And these differences all manifest when people interact with political topics, such as affirmative action, such as mansionization, on a local level, whether to use English on signs. You know, the one anecdote I'm thinking of is in, uh, somebody told me about this. There was a Bay Area call-in station back when uh, mansionization was a very popular topic, right? And uh, so you had some people calling and being like, mansionization is great. It increases the size of my investment. And uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I can build a house that, that is equal to the size of my ambition and pride. Hooray. You know, those callers were Chinese, mainland Chinese. Then there was another group of Chinese callers, that, which was from the 1970s group, who owned the houses next to the large houses. And they're, <laughs> they're calling and saying, you know, mansionization is horrible. It's, it's ruining the character of my community. I have a beautiful California ranch home, and now my view is blocked, you know? And so both of these people are Chinese Americans, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. But um, there's such, and so I guess the main message is that immigration has brought a lot of diversity to the community and made, you know, not any one generalization or simple uh, insight uh, accurate, so. Okay, so uh, one of the projects that uh, I've been involved uh, recently is, um, Chinese American Museum in Sacramento. This is a permanent uh, museum project, and we have a group of people. Some of them are from Southern California, and the historian Judy Yang uh, is is one of the um, 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 uh, person on the advisory board as well. So uh, when we had uh, meetings, uh, conferences, uh, you you can just see how interesting this uh, Chinese America, uh, this community is because we do not uh, agree. <laughs> and uh, some of the people said that this, uh, they don't even like uh, the Chinese American uh, this title because they consider themselves as Chinese of, uh, uh, Americans of Chinese heritage. And uh, there are people talking about whether you come from China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, whether you're born here or um, you're immigrants. Uh, so I think um, diversity really made um, um, makes the community most dynamic and interesting uh, because we all came from different background. Now we came, came to the United States together under this big umbrella called Chinese America. So I said, can we just look at what we uh, actually share in common? Because otherwise, we would not have a museum, right? <laughs> um, so, so just think about the things that we share in common uh, and uh, uh, what a Chinese American community actually mean. Uh, uh, really um, put a lot of things um, into context. I think uh, uh, we are a very uh, global, it's a, it's a small global society. Uh, it's because of the differences that we share. Um, this is a very progressive and forward looking community. Yeah, talking about diversity, I, I have a, a, quick, a, a quick story. A, a, a quick story to tell. I remember uh, when I first came to the U.S. Um, in the early 1980s, people asked me, where are you from? Uh, and, and then they answered for me. <laughs> are you from Hong Kong? Are you from Taiwan? And never say China. And I was wondering, why are you not asking me that I'm, you know, why are you not saying that I'm from China? So there is some reason for it. But today, everybody is from China. <laughs> Whether you are Japanese or Koreans, you know, they, they, they say ni hao to you first. That's and then if you don't respond, they will say konnichiwa or anyo haseyo. <laughs> yeah. Can I, right. can, sure. add, can yeah. I add my story? And I think that the, uh, as a new immigrant and um, categorized by Dr. Joe's uh, book, that I didn't, I'm, I was so fortunate enough that I didn't ex experience the yellow parole and 
because <laughs> obviously I was uh, 100 years ago, and also I didn't experience civil rights uh, prior to 1965, and also, but as an immigrant, I do experience my culture shock, uh, culture shock, shock as well as um, identity uh, trying to find in a common commonality in the new land continent. And uh, when I was, uh, I recall this 18 years ago when I first moved to uh, city of Claremont and uh, my older daughter was only three years old who happened to be in the audience today. And uh, we were just passing by a garage sale and uh, I stopped by and trying to pick up a toy for her. And uh, after we leave, I found that she was hand-holding hand uh, wind wheel toy. And because uh, I noticed that the same, uh, there's, a, there's a one on the ground for sale by the family. So I just forced her to put down that toy. She just resisted <laughs> and cried so desperately. And I <laughs> I was wondering why the toy was so desperate for it. And just uh, finally she gave it up because uh, without her, her linguistic skill was not enough to communicate with me and to tell me the truth. And we left without uh, her picking up that toy. But that happened to be that that's the same toy that he picked up from my house. And uh, the reason I'm doing that I still feel sorry about <laughs> to, to my daughter. <laughs> it's just because uh, as a new immigrant, I think that I don't, I don't want to disgrace my culture because I feel so proud of my culture, culture because I still talked, uh, read the book that uh, someone written for us 2,000 years back. That's a kind of a momentum, and that, that kind of uh, mentality really support me and uh, through, uh, along the way that for me to, the new, to pursue the new life in this new continent. That's my, my story. Now, um, let's shift it a little bit um, because I believe we all have a lot of personal stories to tell. So um, just now, I think, um, uh, Professor Zhao mentioned about the internal diversity of the Chinese uh, community. Um, and then how about what America and America perceive the Chinese community or the Chinese? Like the perception of the Chinese. Um, do you feel that it has changed? And if it has changed, I'm sure it has changed to what, you know, to what extent or in what way? Good or bad? Well, most of us are, are familiar with the uh, many the many challenges that Chinese faced when they came here, whether to work or start a business or just to join their family. Uh, the the earliest Chinese came here actually to the Americas 500 years ago, uh, whether it was in Mexico or Central America and Cuba. Uh, actually, one of my um, great uncles, my grandfather's older uh, brother, came to went to Cuba uh, along with many other laborers who, who went there. So many early Chinese who came here were kind of uh, reviled as lower class workers. You know, maybe you were just house servants, or maybe um, just a field laborer. Uh, but gradually, uh, many Chinese found that they didn't need to work so hard. They could start a business or be their own person. And it is that entre entrepreneurial spirit that I think has really, uh, has really transformed uh, our community from being a, a class of workers and laborers to one of being uh, uh, enterprising uh, uh, innovators and uh, um, and talented musicians and and workers in other fields, so the the process has not been easy. You know, it, we've gone through legal challenges, exclusion, discriminatory laws. Uh, uh, I grew up in a time when there was still redlining in LA. 
So you couldn't move to certain or live in certain neighborhoods. When we moved to Inglewood, which was an all-white community, suddenly, you know, uh, white flight occurred. Uh, things uh, changed in our schools. So uh, we we faced discrimination. You know, people would actually you know spit at us as kids. You know, when you're at school. Uh, so what does that all mean? So the perception has changed uh, of, of who we are, you know, that we're no longer these uh, animals that could be treated like animals, uh, but rather we, we've, I think, gained a lot of respect for being uh, a part of uh, American society. And also, um, I, I want to... Um, uh say a few words about the entrepreneurship thing. So the Chinese are known for being entrepreneurial. Um, and then, you know, running restaurants, that's the known image of a Chinese running restaurant. Like just probably in the mid 2000s, I was driving from San Francisco back to LA and in the middle of nowhere, I was uh, adding gas in, in a gas station like around midnight with my son. And then uh, when I was going out and then there is a guy coming over to me, he said, could I help you? I said, sure. He said, oh, how are you doing? This late at night, are you running a restaurant? Oh. <laughs> I said, do I look like a restaurant <laughs> owner? <laughs> so that's the image of Chinese being you know, entrepreneurial. Eugene is correct in suggesting that uh, the perceptions that Americans have of Chinese Americans have been a very important part of the Chinese American experience. And wh what I would like to add is that uh, America's perceptions of Chinese Americans okay, have always been closely tied to its view of China. So this is why U.S.-China policies, this is why America's uh, attitude towards China are very, very important uh, for understanding the situation of Chinese Americans. And you know, to go back historically, as Eugene said, you know, for a long time, um, Americans uh, looked down upon the Chinese, right? which was one of the many reasons why Congress uh, passed in, 19, uh, in 1882 the first Chinese e Exclusion Act. Okay? And uh, this is also one of the many reasons why in 1943 Congress repealed the Exclusion Acts. Okay? So today the tension between the US and uh, 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 China also revealed a very critical moment in that development. And uh, you know, I um, I believe, and, and ample evidence suggests that, uh, uh, in terms of perceptions, okay, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, taking. It, this is another turning point, okay, uh, taking the wrong turn, and uh, the hostility towards China for ver for whatever reason is uh, unbelievable. You know, oh, uh, um, previously friendly uh, groups, okay, now have changed their attitudes toward China. So it's a reason for concern. Yeah, uh, US-China relations always affect Chinese-American. Um, I would like to um, um, move on to um, you know, the image of Chinese now as a model minority. So I would like the panelists to shed some lights on that change from yellow period, from a threat even though now today the threat is still there to the model minority for the high achievement of Chinese Americans and also the high visibility of that achievement. And I remember when I was first taught a race class in Louisiana State University in 1990, there was a, an African American student in my class raised a question. She said, Professor Joe, would you rather be a model minority that everybody is looked up to, or a downtrodden minority that everybody is looked down on. Now, for that question, you know, what is your thought about the model minority? Perceptions, I would probably again divide it into three eras, right? There was fear, 
um, in the beginning that was caused by economic competition, racism, xenophobia. When Bruce Lee first came to the United States, people were terrified of him. People were terrified of Kung Fu. They passed laws against nunchucks and shobi zoos and all types of Asian weapons, laws which are still on the books today. So if you get caught with a pair of nunchucks outside of a karate school, it's a higher penalty than it is for if you like stole someone's gun and a cop finds you. So it's, uh, you know, the criminalization of Asian culture is something that, you know, was, was enshrined in the law. And now we're in this stage of like, you know, I think in the 80s and 90s began with model minority, which is just assuming that every Asian person, and, and model minority being this problem that affects every single Asian person, not just Chinese people, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, the assumption that, that we're safe, that we're, uh, we have high education levels, that we are uh, rich, and, um, you know, and, and so that manifests, and that also combines with modern day stereotypes about China to affect Chinese people pretty heavily, you know? Um, Right now, uh, the, the stereotypes that Chinese people face is the super rich. You know, uh, people are, uh, yeah. China is known internationally for its wealth because of uh, tourism, because of all of these sort of different, um, because of the media, you know, because stories about Fu Dai were so popular back then, and yeah. stories of, of profligate Chinese wealth was so much fun for people to read that we've, you know, created this monster in which, you know, Chinese people are viewed as the super rich, which obscures a lot of poverty both within the country and within immigration, and also leads to, you know, uh, criminal uh, activity. For example, um, you know, uh, certain rappers have songs, you know, describing how to rob Chinese people in Los Angeles County. You know, you go to Walnut because, you know, people, you. you you assume people there have money, you know, um, and, and that's just an assumption that isn't by any means true for Chinese people everywhere. You know, Chinese people, for example, are the, the poorest minority in, in New York City and also one of the most numerous. And so, you know, these stereotypes are, are definitely something we're, we're, we're still battling, you know, the profusion of college, Chinese college students in U.S. universities, you know, and the way that some students choose to act, you know. Um, definitely adds to that impression as well. Um, you know, the fact remains is that the stereotypes are untrue and that we're just seeing a small portion of the community yeah. magnified, so. Dr. Long. Yeah, I wanted to add to, or just, uh, I totally agree with both uh, speakers uh, talking about the uh, stereotype things. I think that, yeah, from education point of view, from my observation of school kids, kids here in the United States, United States and uh, basically uh, Chinese students and other Asian students has been uh, stereotyped, uh, typed, stereotyped as the, every Chinese kid is good at math, which is not a not true fact. And adding, uh, responding to Frank's uh, note about the uh, super duper rich Chinese, and uh, here's the, uh, the number I just, uh, today I, I did, and uh, about, in new immigrants, 13% of new immigrant Chinese still living on poverty line compared to 9% of uh, main, uh, mainstream people and 15% of overall uh, immigrants to the United States. So that's a fact. So we need to uh, basically uh, put out the stereotype uh, for the facts. That's my message. Yeah, I, I, you know, in 2016, I, I remember writing a, a, an article about how there were many Chinese students in community colleges here in the States. Santa Monica College is one of the most attended by, uh, you know, Chinese students, and, and part of that was cost, you know. Part of that was people who had started a small shop and, and scraped together every single dollar to, to send their kid to the States, which is not a cheap process. So, um, you know, that's definitely an important memory. Yeah, uh, the stereotype actually set the group so stereotyped apart from the general population, apart from being normal American, because you are holding one group up and then you know putting the other group down. So either way, it's that the impact is negative. Like thinking about Chinese as good at math, you can imagine how much pressure is on the kids who are not so good at math, right? <laughs> and who have other talent. And then also have, the impact would have on the, on the parents. So it's not like parents want to be tiger mom, but they, they are under the pressure, both from the stereotype and also from the, the, the reproduce in, within the community to put pressure on the parents. 
to, to, um, to serve as tiger moms. I have a daughter, and she uh, liked the math, and <laughs> she was also a good, was a good student. So for that reason, everyone just, not everyone, that the people who didn't know me uh, would assume that uh, I was a tiger ma mother. <laughs> so at one point, they were talking about some parents who do a really bad. Um, this is uh, actually a group of friends, and someone just uh, turned to my daughter and said, of course, your mother would be. Well, it, it's not as bad as your mom. Huh? And my daughter was like, oh, <laughs> my mom actually never mad at me, uh, or uh, um, I don't ever recall her uh, asking me to go to, uh, uh, to, to, to study or to read books. She would be really <laughs> mad if I do not go to bed uh, after 10.30. And uh, that person was really confused. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is that at uh, one, one point, this was uh, actually UCSB uh, faculty, uh, children were cut. We, we, we ride, we couple to a place, and someone said, Sue, how come you like math? Uh, I said, oh, I like it. And he said, you do not look like someone uh, who uh, is good uh, with math. He said, why? He said, those people are really boring, but you are actually. So it's kind of a compliment. Uh, but uh, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, there, there, there are a number of problems there. One is that you know, if uh, if you are decent students, the only way for Chinese American uh, uh, kids to be good uh, is that they were forced uh, to uh, to study. Uh, they could not be uh, intelligent or be interested in study. And the other thing is that it does add a lot of pressure. Uh, on students who <clears throat> who may have different kind of uh, interest, uh, and uh, uh, here we um, with this title of model minority, we tend to ignore um, the the Chinese Americans who are still uh, below poverty line, uh, and the undocumented immigrants. We talk very little about them, and we have DACA students uh, who are Chinese American, but the, they would not talk to other people because they did not receive uh, sufficient uh, uh, support from the community itself. Yeah, even among the most successful uh, socioeconomically mobile Chinese Americans, the stereotype would have a negative effect on them because the, the stereotype would create new, um, we call it bamboo ceiling for um, young Asian Americans, not just Chinese Americans, when they try to move up the rank in their profession because they are stereotyped as good scientists, good math, good engineers, but not so good leaders. Um, uh, so, so that bamboo ceiling is, has been uh, uh, affecting uh, the social mobility of Chinese Americans. Uh, could, uh, could I add a footnote to that? Very quick footnote. Uh, you know, besides that, even in the world of uh, dating, uh, according to numerous dating services, Asian men are the least desirable. <laughs> May mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Judy Chu, the, our congresswoman, started off in math. She got her bachelor's in math. But she also, I think, was a, a, an awakened um, person by realizing that she wanted to learn more about her Asian American, Chinese American heritage. So she got her master's in Asian American studies. But then she also got her PhD in psychology because she was curious in trying to understand what it is that, that how, how people think and, and organize and how, uh, uh, how our, our thoughts and actions influence each other. Uh, and then she became a leader by by uh, going into politics, becoming uh, uh, not just an educator, but also uh, going in, jumping into the political fray. So uh, I think that, that we're seeing that uh, we don't, people are, 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 are younger generations, I mean, not, Judy's not necessarily part of the younger generation, but our younger <laughs> ones are definitely uh, recognizing that 
that there's more to life than just to uh, getting ahead, uh, but instead it's really doing something for your community. And I think this is what we, uh, I, I think, uh, appreciate uh, in terms of how uh, our, our uh, community has, has changed and that we, we've become uh, more multi-dimensional in our focus.